everyone. My name is Rochelle Amy. I'm happy to be with you today and glad to see names showing up in a list here that you've joined us on this beautiful sunny Tuesday morning. I hope it's sunny where you are. I'm coming to you from Selkirk, Manitoba. Why don't you pop in the chat for me where you're listening from and uh, maybe thumbs up if it's sunny, thumbs down if you don't have the sun today. I'm loving it. Oh, look at you guys from all over the province. Oh man, if we could just solve the problem today on how to make winter wait and we could just hang out in fall a little longer, I would love to solve that problem. Unfortunately, we don't have that luxury, but I'm sure enjoying this week of this bonus fall weather that we're getting and I'm finally getting all my outdoor stuff finished. I did the essentials when it was going, when it turned cold, I did all my must do's outside. Now I'm doing my want to do's <laughs> before winter comes. So thankfully, um, we've got this beautiful day today and I wish we could solve that that question about winter and the problem on how to just be summer all year round. But instead, today we're going to look at some processes and strategies for solving problems, um, what some of the best practices are in the workplace, and just sort of keeping sight of the pulse and the variables of what's happening with problems around us. Of course, you know by now, I'm sure, this is who we are, Workplace Education Manitoba helping people to develop essential skills needed for work, learning, and life. That's pretty much the full picture, right? And this is what we mean by nine essential skills. Essential skills are those foundation pieces that make you successful in the workplace. So this is a map of what they look like. We teach all of these at our West Centers and online. Uh, we kind of love doing it because it touches each one of us in no matter what type of job we do, these skills are present or needed. Now today when we think about problem solving, we're sort of focusing on these three, um, where our thinking skills, it's sort of the big picture thing that we need to sharpen up all the time as we face new problems and work within new teams. And usually that's affecting how we work with each other and our oral communication, not even with colleagues, but sometimes with clients and customers also. Now, working on these nine essential skills happens for Workplace Education Manitoba all over the province. And we have classrooms, actual physical spaces you can go to if, you know, we're not in code red, let's say, <laughs> where you can come and do some in-person learning. Lots of stuff with digital technology, uh, numeracy, reading, writing, and that sort of thing. This is where I come to you from today, our nice classroom in sunny Selkirk, Manitoba. And lots of our digital classes with WEM happen from this facility. And you can always visit us at weminterlake.ca to see what's coming up next. So actually this week, I think within the next 24 hours, our newest classes are getting up on the website. So you're going to be able to see for November. We've got some cool topics coming up. Woohoo! Thank you, Carrie, for giving us the cheers in the background there. And uh, you can sign up for a number of different things. And actually, at the end of this presentation today, don't disappear just so quickly because when I'm done, Carrie's going to pop on her mic and she's going to let you know about a problem-solving workshop that can even take you deeper than what we're going through today. Now, we don't want to buzz right by the people that made this possible. So isn't it great we can attend this webinar? It didn't cost us out-of-pocket money um, because we got funding by ERSDC and Manitoba Education and Training. We're grateful for that, that there was funds available to develop curriculum, and also for Human Resources Skills Development Canada and Entrepreneurship Training and Trade, that these projects are funded by so many partners to make this training accessible to all Manitobans. I love the emoji buttons. Thank you, guys, because as you can tell, this is a pretty one-way delivery, right? I don't get to see you. You don't get to see me. Uh, so our, our interaction in the chat and with those emoji buttons is just life-giving. So thank you. 
Now, don't we all have a lot of gifts? How about an emoji if you feel like you have gifts in your life? And by gifts, we mean problems. Because <laughs> Tony Robbins tells us that a problem is actually a gift because it leads to our own growth as individuals and within an organization. So if you've got a lot of presents, a lot of gifts, <laughs> I see it, right? We have sometimes more than just one little gift in our life. <laughs> well, those gifts bring rewards. There's rewards when we actually work through a problem. Now we know this, if you're a parent, you know that working through some of the problems of let's say potty training results in huge dividends for the rest of that child's life and actually for you as a parent also. Well, when we think about tackling dividends in the workplace, it affects so many things. It affects the quality of our work, which of course increases our reputation. As we do that and we create a synergy in the team and a better product, we start to be able to focus on how to create efficiencies. And a lot of the problems that we face, we bump into them because it's affecting our efficiency. And it seems like that's the category we're constantly honing and trying to refine. And then, of course, good customer relations is good for everyone because it makes not only your job more peaceful, but it certainly affects the bottom line, right? Happy customers, more sales, more profit for the company, maybe profit sharing for you down the road. So let's take a look at our posture. When the problem comes at us, or sometimes we stumble into the problem, what is my own posture when I look at the problem? Do I face a problem? Do I turn away and try to hide from it or run from it? Do I ignore it, hope, hoping that it will go away? Or do I overthink something super tiny and do I have a superpower to turn that into a huge problem? <laughs> we, we tend to have um, a naturally given posture towards problems. And I actually have a good friend who says they run from problems, avoid them at all costs, and it's sort of their life goal to get over it because they are starting to recognize how when they do that, they create all these other little relational problems and then they end up with more than what they bargained for. So take a little bit of a self inventory and get a sense. Maybe you get super energized by tackling a problem. And so you're the, I face it, I deal with it, I run towards it. So know what your posture is because you may be contributing to a problem <laughs> or decreasing um, some of the troubles with some of the problems just by knowing what your natural bent is towards it. Now, when we face a problem, it is important to take a look in the mirror first. Now, let's just recognize there are some problems that are like the buildings on fire and we have to do something about it. So obviously we can't take deep reflective moments <laughs> at that time, right? But there are lots of other problems that are processes, efficiencies, systems, problems, relational problems, where if we can hit the pause button for a second before we react or before we just start solving it, it helps to bring us into a greater place of not only aptitude, but even being interpersonal with the people that we're working on the problem with. So is it my problem? Well, I don't know. Maybe you have a little bit of a problem like me. I have a little bit of a face the problem problem. <laughs> I like to face problems generally more than run from them. And so I find sometimes <laughs> I end up solving problems that really aren't mine. Nobody asked me to solve it. It's not for me to solve. I don't have the time to solve it, but sometimes I just find them interesting. And so I want to solve the problem. So recognizing, is it mine to solve? And should I be doing that? Now, if you're a runaway from a problem person, you need to ask yourself this too. Maybe it is your problem. And by running from it, maybe someone else shouldn't be rescuing it. The other thing is, um, it's a really important self-assessment question to ask, did the problem come to you because someone trusts you? So sometimes we are, you know, spit up on, as it were, pardon the horrible illustration, but sometimes we get that verbal vomit from someone about a problem and it maybe isn't our problem to solve, but maybe they've come to us because they trust us. 
and they need a sounding board. So am I the sounding board or am I the problem solver? I also need to do a little bit of self-assessment when a problem's in front of me to say, what does this create in me? Does the problem create any kind of fear at all? Am I scared of looking stupid? Am I scared of not being able to solve this problem? Am I scared of impacting the company's reputation and sales? Do I have any fear in this game? And conversely, do I have any ego? What nerve is this hitting in me? <laughs> do I need to solve this problem so I'm a superhero? Do I need to solve the problem because I'm bored? Am I running from the problem because I don't want to be embarrassed? Are there issues about this problem that touch my ego also? And then another self-assessment question would be, who all is involved in this? So there's someone who's impacted by the problem, maybe even a team of people impacted, and who will be impacted by its solution? Are there players involved here where I need to be mindful of their fears and egos or of their job descriptions or of their roles and responsibilities and level of authority where I need to bring people in to solving the problem or keep people, some people outside of solving the problem? So we see this a lot if we just think about um, the service industry. A lot of times customers are excluded from the process of solving a problem. As in, the customer is not entitled to know that there is a problem going on. We just lit something on fire in the kitchen. <laughs> We're not gonna dare tell the customers that the kitchen's falling apart while they're sitting there chatting with nice background music in the restaurant. We will exclude them from the problem and we will deal with our systems and processes to be able to deliver a result. And that also can happen within teams where we don't want to create unnecessary fear to other people in the organization. So important to know who actually should be included and excluded because they might be the run from problem people or the run to the problem people. And you don't really want to light too many fires under the wrong people's chairs. <laughs> so when it's in front of us, Sometimes our SOS can feel like this, right? It's like, I have something complex in front of me. I don't know what to do. I need a life raft here. So I want to throw you out some different problem solving strategies. Now, when Carrie joins us at the end, she's going to talk to us about a problem solving workshop that's coming up. It'll be online and it's longer than just our little 30 minutes together. My, my dream for you today is that we could dig into all of these and we could really practice things and develop some mastery. That's sort of a, a problem, as it were, of a dream because I don't think we can do that in 30 minutes. So you do get an opportunity to join in with um, a deeper dive in a problem solving workshop coming up in November. Uh, but for today, let's take a look at the highlight reel and just grab some tools that might help us. So there are four useful, somewhat common methods to look at in terms of how to deal with problems. One would be the ideal method. So using that acronym, recognizing when I have a problem in front of me, I first identify the source of the problem, maybe the root cause of it or why it's actually happening. I define the context surrounding it and I start to explore the solutions and strategies. Therefore, acting on the best solution and then being able to look back and evaluate. If you love acronyms, this is a great one for you because you could pin this up on your bulletin board and refer back to it, especially if you have to do incident reports that outline how the problem worked. This is actually a good rubric on how to write a great incident report too. So if you find you're an acronym lover, go ahead and try that one out. If you're um, a much more visual learner where you really love to do mind mapping and brainstorming, the Ishikawa process is actually really helpful because you're, you're essentially drawing out a fish and all of the bones where you're able to visualize, okay, I have one main problem, but I have all these underlying underlying causes. Sometimes you only have one underlying cause, let's say, 
usually you have multiple because there's usually a couple people involved. And so the causes are coming out of their different departments or their different vantage points and needs. And then I can start to categorize what did those problems look like. Now you can draw in as many little fish bones in between as you want. So you could draw in all the contributing factors to those causes and categories. And let's just use one example and say that one cause is an employee. The employee is maybe always late, let's say. And so that employee always being late would go down below on the causes. And I would categorize that in a personnel issue manner. Well, what are all those little fish bones in between that happen? Well, maybe one fish bone is I know something going on in their life that's an extenuating circumstance. And so they actually have permission to always be late right now. And maybe I know that I've adapted their roles and responsibilities. And so part of the causes on why this problem's happening is because they have an adapted role, whereas the person working with them does not. So you can see how you can add all those little mini fish bones. Now, who's a visual person? Show me um, an emoji. If you love the Ishikawa method, show me a response. Okay, so we have some visuals who love to do that. So you can actually expand on this. It doesn't have to be three categories. Your fish could be super long. <laughs> it's more effective if it's smaller, um, but you can diagram and keep working through that. Now, we also have the five W and two H, the questioning technique. Who is an auditory processor? You like to talk through your problems. You want to verbally process. You want to dissect and brainstorm. Show me an emoji if you talk through and reason it out. This is so important to know about yourself. Now, this particular questioning method, this can be done in a written format, absolutely, but this helps some of us who are verbal processors to be able to ask the questions especially if we haven't determined what a root cause is, right? So we want to be able to ask enough questions that we start to get a sense of what a root cause is and then what all those contributing factors were. So especially if we're dealing with um, a problem that's affecting a team and the whole team is trying to unpack it, this is a great method to ask your who, what, when, where, why, hows, and then how often, how many, how much, and sort of digging in deeper to what the cost of the problem is or what the costs and dividends of a possible solution are. And then this is super creative. If you're a right brainer, if you, you know, you could be all these other things and like all these other categories. Um, but if you're a right brain thinker, and that's not just somebody who's creative and likes to paint a painting, we're talking often about people who are really good with numbers and data. And so they're detail oriented and they like to look at creative solutions. Are you one of those people? That is like a great camp to be in and you deserve a pat on the back if that's you. Give me an emoji. Don't be shy. You can celebrate yourself. Uh, this is really cool. If you take a look at a problem, you have to come up with a minimum of seven solutions or alternatives to how this can be tackled and under each seven you're basically doing pros and cons so one of the creative ways we see this technique at play would be for example with directors in um, movies and theater production where they often won't accept um, an actor's first contribution of an improv or a first contribution of modifying a script or a character they often make them prove three or more little alternatives before they realize they're going to get to that golden nugget of what's really going to work for the production. So directors are really good at doing this. Um, but if you're a detail person and you love to measure things, this is such a great one because you get to score each of the alternatives and then make the best decision based on that information especially if you're in high risk situation, a lot of money is at stake, a lot of safety, or there's some kind of risk at play. The seven ways method can be a great piece of research and backup that you can have to show why you chose the method that you did choose. So there's something there for everyone, really. There are more ways too, but those are some of the common ones that people find when you're working with a complex 
problem, you can logically push your way through to a solution. This is so true. Is this not true? <laughs> we actually create more problems when we're just using the same thinking that we did originally that created them. So being able to think outside of the problem and think, let's be creative. If we got ourselves into this mess, maybe the way out of it might even be to try a different problem solving method than we usually use on our team. I love this, um, this contribution from Frontiers in Psychology because we sometimes think that decision making um, has its own merits and benefits, but actually um, in deeply complex social environments, we're told that the research shows that decision making has been considered an important factor for contributing to organizational efficiency and workplace satisfaction. So the decision making on its own, you know, being able to get a job because you're a good decision maker is maybe one thing that you think is helpful about an individual, but it actually has huge dividends on how efficient any organization and workplace could be and how satisfied the people are that work there. Now we, we could dig in really deep with some of these scenarios, but I just wanna give you an overview that let's say there's production line, let's say that the clerk who processes the parts knows that quality is number one. But in one particular case, they noticed that they received poor or quality parts. And so they have to determine, what do I do? We have this excellent reputation for quality standards, but things are also supposed to be on time and within budget. And so I'm caught in the middle between time and budget value and excellent reputation and safety value. So what are some questions I can consider about this problem? Maybe there's policies and procedures I need to look to. And some of those might outline out of our company's values, which ones hold the trump card or sort of which ones are more powerful than all the other policies and procedures. There's usually a pecking order to those policies and procedures. Who might I need to approach? So um, is it a chain of command thing or is it a department thing where I have to go to certain departments instead of just up the chain of command ladder? Do I look at whether this is something that happened within our company or is this an external supplier that's made provision of these parts to me? And then please camp out on this bottom one, please, 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 <laughs> in your role with the problem in front of you, what do they want you to do with the problem? Do you have a supervisor or group of managers who want you to solve the problem? Or do they want you to jury out possible solutions by incorporating more voices at the table? You do want to know this. Do they want you to be a problem solver or a problem reporter? And do they want you to just follow directions on how that problem should be solved? Or do they want you to come up with a multiple part scenario of how the problem could be solved? You need to know this about the people that you work with. This is so great. Of course, I do lean towards facing a problem instead of just running from it. <laughs> but not everything that is faced can be changed. However, absolutely nothing can be changed until it's faced. So there is merit at turning towards the storm. And actually, fun fact for us, because we're all Manitobans in this workshop today, did you know that the Manitoba bison, they always face into a storm, whether that be a blizzard, a rainstorm, a windstorm, they turn and they take their posture facing the storm. I just love that fun fact about Manitoba bison. So let's be like the bison, okay? <laughs> Looking at your values and your company's values, these are not suggesting that there's a right answer to these. Every company is different and people over profit sounds beautiful. It sounds like the right answer, but that's not always true. Sometimes it's profit over people. And so you need to know what your company's values are, not just your own personal bias values. It's always better that you tackle it, say it, do it, than for your customers, let's say, or your competition to be whispering about what that solution should be. 
So when we're looking at being within a team and tackling problems that happen in that group, we want to make sure we've underscored and understood the company's values, underscored and understood our company's goals, identifying the route and doing the things. So doing the things is just, you know, a little bit of slang in this slide. So hopefully you have a good sense of humor and you can bear with us in that. But doing the things always leads us to underscoring the values. We all want to do the right thing, right? Even if you're selfishly motivated and you want to do the right thing that gets you advanced in your career, if that maybe is more important to you than the company, really those things you do have to underscore the company values and it should take you through that cycle where the people involved, whether that be internal or external external stakeholders where those people get to see you underscoring the company values its goals and then knowing that you're always dealing with the root of the problem working together precedes winning together write that down say it four times fast working together precedes winning together collaboration is multiplication i so incredibly believe in this because i feel like when I'm out experiencing other companies that I don't work for, you can almost feel collaboration in the building. You can feel whether that team works well together or not. And it's always a win to external customers. We're going to pass by um, another scenario to look at um, and just think about um, maybe setting for ourselves some, some goals when we're looking at the problem. Again, remember at the start of our session today, I mentioned some problems are fast moving, you know, the building's on fire, I got to do something quick. Some we get a little bit more time to dive into. So we need to recognize right away, what's the bleeding? What's the fire? What's the emergency part of the problem? And let me do something to mitigate that instantly. Once that part is dealt with, and maybe sometimes that's even passing that part off to someone else, so they deal with the emerging emergency part and I move on to the root problem part. So maybe did someone fall and break their hip walking into our building? We need to appoint someone to deal with the broken hip. But did they fall because there was a patch of ice? Now I need to deal with the patch of ice. And why is the patch of ice there? Was there someone who was supposed to deal with that patch of ice? Maybe I'll mo mobilize someone to deal with that root problem, but digging deeper in order to prevent a recurrence, I might need to adjust my shift schedule so that someone's there to address the patch of ice before we open for business that day. So our problem solving goals are what's the immediate that needs to happen? What were the root problems contributing to it? And how do I keep it from happening again? If we keep a problem solving log, it certainly helps us with the how do I keep it from happening again? Often this needs to happen in community. You can do all the assessments on your own, but I really hope for your sake that you have someone else that you can bounce these ideas off of, whether that's a supervisor or just a team member, um, recognizing that working in community often brings better solutions to deeper problems. So again, um, looking at if I'm gonna solve this problem in the best possible way, what are the things I need to know? I need to know my own strengths and capacities and even the authority I've been given. I need to understand the bigger picture of the culture and what the pecking order of priorities and values are in my company. And then of course, my relationship to the client and even where I am in the whole rollout of systems delivery with the end user of whatever product we provide. So I want to go so deep with you all on these things and take more time for it. But like, you know, there's this giant buzzer going off in the background where I just have only been afforded 30 minutes with you today. So I want to pass it over to Carrie before I turn my mic off. I just want to thank you so much for being here. If I had an emoji button at the top of my screen, I'd emoji you right back. But Carrie, it's all yours now. Right on. Thanks, Rochelle. And I think I misinterpreted, Benita, your question. This presentation itself will not be shared. However, 
hop into webmentorplate.ca to sign up for our expanded version with Michelle talking about problem solving. So we're, we'll be able to dive a little bit deeper, have a bit more banter than this one-way delivery, and really, really glean some amazing insights, not just from Michelle and her many ways of solving problems, which I've seen firsthand with patience and with a calmness, but also to be able to have that interaction and communication with one another. As cheesy as it sounds, it's truly where those gems come from. So thank you for joining us today. And remember, hop into webinterlake.ca for a little deeper dive into problem solving coming up Monday, November 30th from 1 to 3. Take care, everybody. Go forth and be awesome. Have a great day.